Being at this conference is a great honor. I've enjoyed hearing the other speakers, and I feel your heart, your passion, and your great interest in helping people to live a longer, better quality life. I, like you, am searching for the truth, the answers, including protocols that may very well transform the health and the future of your patients and quite possibly the nation. When I first uh, got introduced to health and healthcare, I thought I was on a good health program. I was uh, wanting to play football and gain weight uh, when I was in high school, and I wanted to go to USC, and so I gained about up to 220 pounds in that first picture, and uh, <clears throat> yet I suffered a neck injury in football, and so I wasn't able to continue to play, but I retained the weight. Then. Shortly after I had a, a stroke, a TIA, a transient ischemic attack, a small stroke, I fell to the ground on Thanksgiving and I went to see the doctor. I was on blood pressure medication, supposedly protected. I didn't understand how I had suffered the stroke and why I had high blood pressure. And I started reading the literature I met Nathan Pritikin. He wrote a book, Live Longer Now. How many here have heard of the Pritikin program or Nathan Pritikin? I went to a seminar that he did back in Pasadena in 1978, and after six hours of hearing him speak, he had enlightened me about pathology and disease and conditions that no other doctor or educator, television program, journal, or magazine had ever shared or created that kind of clarity. I decided to transform my life. I went up to meet with him at the end of the seminar, like we often do. In our uh, arena, it's great because we can talk to the speakers and pick their mind. And I showed him a picture of myself, before and after. In fact, I showed him that very first picture, a little bit hippie look, the long hair there. I was holding in my stomach for the picture in the upper left. Uh, the picture to the middle right, I was holding in my stomach, but I had lost 50 pounds. And I followed a lifestyle that was advocated essentially close to what Nathan Pritikin was teaching. And he invited me to come to the Pritikin Longevity Center at the age of 23 and train and study and be part of the research department with Mount Sure Massey and review the medical literature, which was a time, an opportunity of a lifetime. I stopped my education at Loma Linda University. I put it on hold temporarily. I was in a master's leading to a doctorate program. And I was studying with what I thought was the greatest research time ever team ever assembled. In fact, Julian Whitaker spent some time there, about six months before I was working with Nathan Pritikin. I spent three years right alongside Nathan Pritikin, along his side, taking in every bit of information, listening to every talk, reading hundreds of medical journals, and I found that there was one thing that Nathan Pritikin had done. He understated the possibility that we could reverse heart disease, diabetes, arthritis. He rarely spoke about cancer because he knew there was a lot of political implications, but I took a great passion about studying cancer. For some reason, it, to me, it seemed like such a rare disease or a common disease, but something that no one had ever solved. And I, I'm that type of person. I just want to know the answer and I want to figure things out. Even if no one's ever figured it out, I want to know. I want to figure it out. So. Through the years, as I've reviewed the medical literature and studied and become one of the speakers at anti-aging conferences and mastered the subjects, in the next picture at age 48, the transition from age 23 to 48, you can see I added some muscle density, not as a bodybuilder, but to preserve my lean body mass so that as we age, as we age, we often do what? We lose our lean body mass. We lose our ability to function. We lose organ density. And so it was my goal to figure how I could perfect and improve my health and the patient's health and those of the doctors that I educate, how they could take their health to a new level. Uh, I then continued training and I started uh, doing some things that for the sake of teaching people about autism awareness because one of my children at, uh, who is now age 24 was born with autism. Uh, his mother had RH factor and I was negative and so they gave him a shot which later Dr. Mayor Eisenstein told me that it was very concentrated in mercury. And 
So for 24 years, I reviewed the literature and searched for answers. And I even thought at some point that maybe his brain damage could be solved by stem cells. So I became my own human guinea pig. I had 10 stem cell treatments myself over the course of five years. And those are the pictures on the bottom during the course I was taking stem cell treatments. And I was shocked because although his mother would not allow me to intervene with treatments for various reasons, I felt that the research needed to be developed further because there were doctors and educators who questioned, should we use hormones for patients? Should we use stem cells? Should we wait 20 years for the literature to come in, even though for 35 years, leukemia patients have had success with stem cell treatments? I knew that these treatments were safe. Dr. Ron Rothenberg at UC San Diego, a professor, and Dr. Terry Hertog from Belgium had eloquently explained the beneficial use of bioidentical hormones. So I began restoring my hormone levels to optimum levels, to that of a young person, even though in the bottom picture at age 53 and now I'm 55. And I continue to search for any answer that will not only improve the quality of life, but may very well transform the whole future of health care. And I'd like to show you a, a brief tape if that can be shown and then we'll continue with the talk. Uh, with that note, my new book came out last week, Stem Cells for Joint Fitness and uh, Anti-Aging Methods to Feel Great. Dr. Delgado is a man with boundless energy, uh, with tremendous capability, and uh, he's, um, well, he's really one of a kind. Uh, Dr. Delgado, uh, in addition to being a really uh, a fine educator, uh, is also uh, a world-class athlete in his own right and uh, is really known by uh, thousands of physicians at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine all around the world. Uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce this man and uh, to, uh, to, to offer my thanks and the thanks to the Academy for the service that he has provided, uh, not just to the Academy, uh, but to really all the physicians and scientists of the world who are involved in the new science of anti-aging medicine because uh, Dr. Delgado is really a I think a, an excellent role model uh, for, for what anti-aging medicine can be. Uh, Dr. Delgado in his 50s now uh, is really uh, looks <laughs> better and performs better uh, than probably any other time during his life. I've n had the pleasure of knowing him for many years and I've seen him get better and better and better every year, not just as an athlete, uh, but also as an educator. He's sharper now than he has been in the, than any time I've known him in the past. Uh, he's, uh, he's stronger, and um, his command of uh, the uh, really vast area of nutritional medicine, uh, preventive medicine, and many of the innovative therapies around the world uh, make Dr. Delgado really a favorite uh, speaker and educator uh, for the Academy. So uh, uh, again, uh, let me uh, welcome you all and uh, let me thank uh, Dr. Delgado for giving me this opportunity to introduce him. In the U.S. today, we have a short life expectancy past the age of 40. We rank 38th in the world compared to 60 other nations. You consider third world countries that may actually outlive us, although at birth they have maybe a higher infant mortality rate due to unsanitary conditions. The killer diseases in our Western world, of course, atherosclerotic plaques, narrowing the arteries, stroke, brain damage, diabetes, cancer. Infectious diseases are rather under control. So the question is, how long will you live? Jean Calumet lived to 120 years of age, although she died in a care center of dehydration. She might have lived longer. No one ever augmented her hormones or did stem cell treatment. What would have, done, what would have happened had she done so? The oldest man ever to live, according to current records, is 114 years. And we look then 
at the literature, an interesting correlation, that is lovers, or those people who are in love, live longer. Dr. Weeks reviewed over 3,500 patients, 18 to 102 years of age. He showed that those with the highest frequency of sexual or intimate contact lived the longest, had the fewest wrinkles, had the best posture, stood taller, and had a light-hearted attitude. There are certain herbs and ingredients that help to enhance libido and sex and energy and well-being and organ rejuvenation. And this is part of the essence of life. And yet, today we have a world epidemic of impotency in men. ED is a predictor of the risk of heart attack, stroke, prostate cancer. Amongst these men, they have the highest incidence. And this is, of course, by definition, ED unable to enjoy satisfying um, penetration with their partner. Men, in, according to the Urology Journal, 30,000 hospitalizations, 400,000 doctor visits, spending over $150 million. And that was back in 1994. Expenditures are even higher now. The reason we're concerned about ED is because in often it is the precursor to atherosclerotic plaques in the male organ, the small male organ. And so as the organ clogs up with cholesterol plaques, it is a predictor that the same plaques are accumulating in the heart, the coronary arteries, all on up to the brain. How many here treat uh, brain injury patients, primarily stroke victims? If you look through their history, you may find out if a doctor was asking the appropriate questions whether they had a history of ED or had to use Viagra, although not everyone uses Viagra because it's somewhat of a private conversation, although the public media has made it a commonplace discussion. The longevity secrets, though, of Okinawa and Bama, China, these individuals who live upward to 100 plus, they follow a different kind of a healthy lifestyle that I would advocate to you. Their hormones are higher. I'll show you a little evidence. They have a higher testosterone in an age 100 year old than compared to an individual in our culture, age 60 or 70. They have delayed incidences of chronic diseases, including Alzheimer's, cardiovascular, and cancer, are far lower in these particular cultures. Herbal medicine is common. They have a lot of family support. They experience love through uh, their generations. And fitness and vegetable-based diets are the rule. Anti-aging is possible, even in our culture. This is Bob Del Delmatique in the center at age 84. You can see Kelly on the far left, age 73, and Colleen, her daughter, age 44. But look at Bob at age 17, then age 67 and 80, actually looking better with age. How do you sustain such a phenomenal physique past the age of 80 or 90? And the question is, is how many here are in as good a shape as Bob Del Matique or Kelly Nelson? Raise your hand or stand up if you are. <laughs> Bob is one of my coaching clients. I accept doctors and, and clients around the world, and so I know what they know, and then I take them to the next level to help to ensure the quality of life and the probability of not just longevity, but that in which we all look forward to. Based on the Delgado protocol, this is a partial list of conditions that this protocol that you can implement in your practice and help people to overcome or to deal with in a challenging effect. Arthritis, the pain of the joints, inflammatory pain, MS, lupus, these are conditions that affect over 60 million Americans, and yet the origin I'm going to explain in the next 45 minutes. Atherosclerosis, heart disease, stroke, gangrene, and you treat in hyperbaric oxygen gangrenous limbs. How many here do come across people with gangrenous limbs and treat successfully? That's right. Uh, hypertension. At one time I had high blood pressure, and I thought I would have high blood pressure for the rest of my life until my final stroke. Fortunately, for the last 30 years, my blood pressure has been completely under control, free of medications, much like I show my clients within 30 to 60 days how to normalize blood pressure, and it has nothing to do with tension, stress. Contrary to popular belief, although stressful people may eat foods that they shouldn't eat or they may not exercise the way they should, these are the implement conditions that we have to talk about. What about cancer, breast, colon, and prostate? A rather complex variety of diseases that we'll discuss in a moment. Diabetes, we have solutions here, as well as digestive disorders, colitis, diarrhea, Crohn's, and of course, constipation. It's like the traffic out here in Orange County, constipation. Everyone's constipated, they can't get anywhere. 
And yet bowel movements should occur at least two or three times a day. Most of you are dehydrated, you get far less fiber than you should, and the average person needs at least 30 to 60 grams of fiber a day. Today you've had less than three or four grams of fiber, unless you stopped by my booth and had one of the blended drinks. That would have added about 17 grams of fiber, almost what you need. Hormone deficiencies, as we age, shake the hand of the person next to you and tell me which person has colder hands. Right now, shake a person's hand, right now, who is colder? Come on, shake hands, don't be embarrassed, please, shake hands. Touch their hand, just touch their hand. Don't be embarrassed. Who's colder? Just tell me who's colder. Touch his hand. Okay, who's colder? Raise your hand if you were the cold hand. Raise your hand if you were the cold hand. If you were to see a doctor and you were scheduled for an office visit because you had a fever and he said you have a 102 degree temperature, do not go to your office, go home and take these meds, do whatever it takes, hydrate because you're sick. Now consider this. You go to your doctor and your temperature in the morning, every morning is 96 or 97, not 98.6. You have at least 37 different metabolic diseases that are worsened because of this low thyroid problem, hypothyroidism, and your doctor should say the same. Go home, you're sick. What are you going to do to fix that? Every doctor in the country, if you have hypothyroidism, what do they do? They give you T4 which is a solution that's inappropriate. T4, and this was based on endocrinology, Dr. Terry Hertog and his family of generations of endocrinologists from Belgium, pointed out that the T3 is the only bioactive form of thyroid that works appropriately. So if you were given T3 and T4 and L-tyrosine along with a high dose iodine of at least 12 to 24 milligrams a day, then you probably have warm hands. If not, you are suffering from a metabolic disorder of which aging will accelerate. We also know that every doctor in the world would prescribe you thyroid with a hypothyroid condition. But why do doctors not prescribe testosterone when you're low? Why do they not prescribe cortisol when you're low? Adrenal dysfunction? Even President uh, Kennedy had uh, Addison's disease. He would never have been president if his doctor had not diagnosed him as deficient in cortisol. Because without enough cortisol, you can't fight stress. You can't fight inflammatory diseases. He had a history of back problems. There was many conditions that were resolved by the use of hydrocortisone. It was a miracle drug. The Nobel Prize was awarded for the discovery of cortisone. But then the medical profession, the pharmaceutical, got a hold of it, and they developed prednisone, a synthetic drug that lingers in the body too long, and its half-life caused side effects. So doctors gave up on the natural cortisol solution unless you read the book Safe Uses of Cortisol by William McKinley Jeffries, you would have forgot this amazing discovery. But most of my patients have adrenal dysfunction. Most of them have low thyroid levels. By the time you're 80, I guarantee you're 90, you'll be so depressed in hormone levels, your testosterone so low, that one study showed that the average 100-year-old centurion, in 80% of the cases misdiagnosed, suffered from depression. Well, what does depression come from? Lack of testosterone, lack of hormones. We look at this, fibroids and sexual dysfunction, obesity, hearing, eyesight, glaucoma. Has anyone ever told you that interocular pressure builds up high pressure in the eye from excess triglycerides, fat in the blood, that shows up in the blood within four hours of the ingestion of oils and fats? The number one cause of glaucoma. High blood pressure of the eye could be solved in 30 days. And yet most people go blind with glaucoma. Because people don't know protocols, the hearing loss, the incidence of hearing loss as cholesterol clogs the arteries to the ear. You can't hear any longer because when Mozart lost his hearing due to cholesterol that clogged his arteries to his ear, one of the greatest composers in history lost his hearing. And yet the ability to hear is not damaged by loud sounds in Czechoslovakia they put people subjected to very high intense sounds and not one person recorded hearing loss. But in that same Czechoslovakia manufacturing plant, which would have never been allowed in, in our country, EPA laws would not have allowed the high sounds, not one person lost their hearing because their diet is much different than ours. But in our country, an 80-year-old has 70 times worse amplified hearing than an 80-year-old in other countries such as this, so we know that there are protocols for liver disease and kidney disorders. Autism is increasing at a very high rate. And I, I want to thank Dr. Gary Gore and Dr. Jerry Cancinell and Dan Danatelli and their work to 
work to help to find a solution to autism. And every time that I trained to break a world record, and in October of 2007, I trained to break the world strength endurance record to raise awareness for autism, to tell people that an old athlete of age 53 could compete against people half my age and let people know that it's the right of children to not suffer autism, cerebral palsy, and other brain damage diseases that may be very well helped by hyperbaric oxygen and altitude conditioning and hormone therapy and cortisol therapy and dietary therapy. I'm here as an advocate for you to teach you and to guide you that there are certain herbs. A vena sativa nettles releases your own testosterone level. You don't even have to take testosterone half the time. There are products that actually increase natural testosterone levels. In fact, in 1996, my testosterone level was measured 1.3. The free testosterone level is that is of a 70-year-old when I was at that age, uh, I believe barely 38 or whatever that is. I then took these herbs and my testosterone went up to 28 in less than three weeks. My total testosterone improved from 344 to 860. I now stand before you with maintaining a testosterone level of that of my 20, 17 to 31 year old sons by doing combination of herbs and supplements to maintain. Long jack, green lip muscle known to enhance growth hormone levels and testosterone. So there's many natural ways and when I was in the Malaysian jungles going to feed the monkeys, I have a passion to go to other countries and investigate the wildlife. We, we bought bananas to feed the monkeys and I was with five other men and we went into the forest and this gentleman here admittedly uses synthetic steroids, very, very high alpha male testosterone levels. But when we got into the rainforest, not one monkey sensed his presence. Every monkey skipped the other five men and ran after me, chasing me to, to scare me off, to keep me away from their female monkeys. <laughs> I know they were males because they had a big organ and the females were sitting behind them and they could sense my incredibly high natural testosterone levels. They ignored the big bodybuilder and they went right after the alpha male of the group. So if you don't know your hormone levels, go into a rainforest with monkeys and they'll show you and you'll find out real quick what your hormones level are. Are you looking older than your mate or aging faster than normal? Okay, so why am I showing this story? New England Journal of Medicine showed that in 200 individuals, they took men in a five-year study and believe it or not, they made them look at women's augmented or natural breasts and they gazed for 10 minutes and they actually measured a dramatic increase in testosterone in the men during the course of five years. They even predicted that it would add five years of additional, four to five years of additional life by looking at beautiful women. We're human, we're natural. You go out in the rainforest, you were naked in primitive times. You ran naked in the rainforest. You loved the, the environment, the energy. And now we're all clothed and we walk around all stern and, you know, Puritan. And that's what it is. Hopefully you found your mate and you're, you're, you're enjoying intimate function and, 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 and care and loving and caressing every day. Because your hormones depend on it. Your longevity depends on it. In fact, the centurions in Okinawa, age 100 compared to 70 year olds in our country, notice that the centurions had a testosterone average of 439 compared to only 298 in 70 year olds, 30 years younger than them in the women. The women had higher natural DHEA levels, higher natural estrogen levels, 30 years older by a difference in diet and lifestyle. Did they live longer? Of course they do. The longest lived people in the world are where? Okinawa and Bama, China. You look at then blood doesn't lie. What does your blood look like? Have you ever seen your blood under high magnification? Unfortunately, back uh, about a decade, there were some unscrupulous people that had taken microscopes and they would go to events and test people. And in Arizona, they would take a drop of blood and put it under a microscope and they would then make sure they went to the part of the slide where the cells were all sticking in the corners. And they say, look, you have clump blood. You have rouleau, agglutination. They then give them a digestive enzyme and they say, let's wait five minutes. They would then wait five minutes, take another blood drop and go to the middle of the slide where the cells are always separated. And they say, hey, our product cured your blood condition. 
you need this digestive enzyme. Well, it was outlawed in Arizona for good reason, because there was unscrupulous people doing the test. So I started a certification course that's going to start in Orlando and Las Vegas at the A4M. And we do the certification training here in Costa Mesa. So I teach all the doctors and the nurses and the practitioners how to do the test properly. And then we do one step further. You know what the number one cause of Rouleau or clumping of the blood is? Anyone know? What's the number one cause of Rouleau, which means stack of coins or stickiness of cells clumping together? What's the number one cause? Here, let's see. Let's see who, who's got an answer. Huh. What, what did you say here, sir? Dehydration or viscosity? Dehydration is the number two cause. What's the number one cause? What did you say? What did you say? Lack of oxygen. Well, it's the end result of Rouleau is lack of oxygen. You depress your oxygen by 20 to 30 percent when this situation occurs every day after you eat. What's the number one cause? What? Digestion. Now, why do you say digestion? Everyone has digestion, so I, I don't. That's not clear enough. What's the number one cause? Who said that? The number one cause of Rouleau fat clumping in the blood is? Triglycerides. And what are triglycerides, everyone? Fat. It's fat. Dr. Roy Swank, any of you treat patients with MS? He wrote a book. Any of you ever read Dr. Roy Swank's book from Oregon? Out of University of Oregon? He stated that when he had twins who had MS, that over a 40-year period, that the twin that consumed less than 20 grams of fat per day, 10 to 15 grams of fat a day, under 10% fat, that the longevity of that patient with MS, little or no symptoms or complications, in fact, they lived relatively a normal life, the myelin sheath was rarely damaged or harmed. No neurological damage in most cases, but the twin who ate the average American 100 grams of fat a day as that fat would pour into the bloodstream. And I searched the literature, because when I worked at the Pritigan Center, we had a video, and we actually would show, because some people say, well, wait a minute, we're low under a microscope. That's, that's staged. You're looking at a slide. They took a microscope, put it right to the capillary of the eye, and then they did this. They gave them the equivalent of 70 grams of fat. Does McDonald's hamburger or Burger King have at least 70 grams of fat? Have you read the, the, the in, nutritional insert? Yes, it does. 70 grams of fat within one hour. You can see the blood cells, which were freely flowing through the capillaries, the smallest little blood vessels. Within one hour, the cells started to stick together. Within two hours, when one red blood cell, which does anyone know the size of a, how many microns is a red blood cell? What's the size of a red blood cell? Anyone know? Who said that? Seven. What'd you say? Eight. eight. Eight or nine microns. Does anyone know the size? Does anyone know the size of a capillary? What's the general, the small size of a capillary? Five to seven microns. Who answered that? Five to seven? You, you answer that? Will you listen to my tapes and videos? No. Okay, you won't. <laughs> you said five microns? Five or six, seven or nine or whatever, right? You did? Thank you. you did? No, he did. He did. There you go. So how does a red blood cell that's nine microns get through seven? What does it do? It bends itself backwards. Yes. It takes its biconcave shape and like a pancake, you imagine a pancake or an omelet, it flaps over and it squeezes through exchanges of oxygen and nutrients. Hyperbaric oxygen will arguably increase oxygen exchange by how much in your general circulation after one hour session? Anyone know? At least 20 times. 20 times, okay. Can you imagine after every breakfast, lunch, and dinner, the average American consumes at least 80 to 100 grams of fat. And when they looked at the capillaries in the blood, by the fourth hour, you know what the triglycerides went from? 
from an average of under 100, which should be always the case in postprandial after eating. But your doctors 20 years ago gave up on postprandial. They said everyone has to fast for blood tests. You know why they said you have to fast? Because everyone had elevated levels. No one could pass the test postprandial because they all ate junk. They all ate too much fat. So what happened was the exchange of fat, and what is it about olive oil, virgin olive oil, that's the worst? What is the worst thing about virgin olive oil? What is its mechanical property, not that it's polyunsaturated, not that it's monounsaturated, what is the property that makes olive oil so harmful, or corn oil, or safflower oil, or any oil other than olives, or nuts and seeds in the natural state? What is it about the oil that makes it so harmful? Oxidation. Okay, she said oxidation. Does anyone else have a theory about, have you ever taken oil and put it in your hand, like Nathan Pritikin first showed me, and you take that, that oil in the hands, touch your hands to your face, and then put a little powder known as sugar on that oil. Does it stick? Does it stick? It's a mechanical process that causes at least most disease and oxygen deprivation because the red blood cells will stick for at least 16 hours, and I've observed it myself on 100,000 people I've tested in the last 30 years. Yet I can show you a way to maintain your triglycerides low and constant. I'm a medical professional. I must contain myself. Sorry for those of you I've offended. <laughs> but the fat, which clumps the blood cells together, disappears within 14 hours, and you've got a new lease on life. You start eating raw fruits and vegetables, beans and peas. You exercise, and you clear those triglycerides, and you increase the oxygen content to your brain by 20 to 30 percent. Furthermore, if you have triglycerides chronically, is that a probable cause of hypertension? 120 over 80, the top number, 120, what is that? It's thick blood when it goes to 180, 190, 200. And what does your body do in response to not enough oxygen? What does it do in response to not enough oxygen? It falls asleep. No. no. What does it do when there's not enough oxygen? What does your brain do? It goes into a state of semi-unconsciousness. It shuts down. You, you fall asleep. You fall asleep. So lack of oxygen to the neurological tissue is the number one cause of MS. Quite probably the origin, according to Dr. Swank, not according to me. And then, guess what they measured when they looked at the blood in, in, inside the blood vessels? After they gave them rice, fruits, and vegetables with no olive oil added, the blood cells continued to flow properly and appropriately with a triglyceride under 120. So when I test the microscopy, I make sure that you do a digital readout and find out if the triglycerides is under 140 and there's no clumping, then that's a good test. If the triglycerides are over 400 and you see the fat, it looks like a snowstorm in the blood and the cells are clumping together, you have a pathological precondition. What is the number one cause of cancer? According to the Nobel Prize winners, when they showed that they took petri dishes and deprived it of oxygen, some of the cells died, but what happened to the cells that didn't die? Anyone? They mutated. They turned cancerous. They took the cells, injected them animals, they formed tumors, and they died. Every day you deprive your body of oxygen, you are putting yourself at risk for cancer. Every time you eat mayonnaise, butter, cheese, and oil, and fat. But you don't have to. You can start tomorrow. Blood doesn't lie. Here's healthy blood. This is blood when it's dry. This is oxidative stress. Have you ever seen free radical damage? I challenge you, if you have this much free radical damage in the blood, these white holes is polymerized protein. If you have that much holes in your blood, send your urine off to Genova Lab or one of the clinical labs, University of Colorado, and have them tell you your total oxidative stress level. And I assure you, you will find that you have so much free radical damage potential in oxidative stress that is a precancerous condition either to cancer or arthritis. So blood, when I see this profile, I see colon problems. I see sialic acid beads. Look up the literature. That's cancer. 
maybe 20 years before it's even developed. The time it forms a tumor, it's big enough to be palpated. It's been in your system for 20 years. What is cancer that's been in your system growing for 20 years likely to have done? Metastasize. So we remove the breast. Do you realize the cure rate from cancer is no better than it was when we started chemotherapy and radi radiation? Are you aware of that? The only difference that's occurred is being able to diagnose the condition earlier with testing equipment, yet the survival rate, once that cancer starts, is no better because when it metastasizes to the brain or the liver or the pancreas, you die. Just like Patrick Swayze, you die, pancreatic cancer. How many hamburgers did he have to eat? How much fish and chicken, which has as much cholesterol as red meat? What about parathyroid cancer? Or what about hypercalcemia? You can see things in the blood that occur so far in advance. And if you know, and you're doing hyperbaric oxygen, and you want to instruct your patients what's going on, look at heavy metal rings. Send that off. This guy was a metal worker. He worked with metal shavings every day. And he told me he did not wear a mask. And there was these heavy metal rings that we've correlated, send it off to the laboratory. And you know what we measure? Cadmium, lead, mercury, heavy metals. Are those potentially cancerous? Absolutely. Can you detoxify? Do you know Dr. Burkett gave animals an LD50 toxin that would kill 50% of the animals or more? He then put one group on a high fiber diet. He gave them a lethal dose, not one died. He then gave the other group a fiber-free diet, like the American diet. No fiber. Every animal died on the LD50 dosage. The metals and toxins accumulate in your brain, in your tissues, in your fat, and it kills you. It sets the stage for cancer, or you just use Roto-Rooter, which is fiber. Does potatoes have fiber in it, yes or no? Yes. Does carrots have fiber in it, yes or no? Do pears have fiber in it, yes or no? Does chicken and fish have fiber in it, yes or no? No. Do eggs have fiber in it, yes or no? Does butter have fiber in it, yes or no? Always ask yourself that question, because if you are eating foods without fiber, they are no longer natural. They've been processed. They were never intended to go into your body in the concentrations. Am I a purist? At times, I want to hold you to a high level. Do I say you have to eat like an austere diet? No. But will it help to fight cancer? Maybe. It's possible that medicinal mushrooms, Napa cabbage, bok choy, detoxify harmful cancerous byproduct. The androgens. And we know that testosterone is the agonist to, to estrogen, estrogen dominance. That giving women testosterone in the presence of cancer may very well accelerate the healing process. We use testosterone pellets. We also know that women with a high breast cancer rate have the highest rate of prolactin. And at the Pritikin Institute, we measured women's prolactin levels. Do you know who discovered the cause of cigarette smoking and related that to cancer, lung cancer? Who was the name? Does anyone know the name? Well, it was actually Ernest Winder. And I sat in on his lecture in 1979. And he said, one day I was puffing on a cigarette. And I thought to myself, maybe that's the cause of lung cancer. And then he went on to say, maybe fat is the cause of breast cancer. He then correlated the Thai people, Thailand and Vietnamese. You know how much fat they eat? Very little, very low fat diet. I've been to Thailand, and not to Vietnam yet, but to Thailand. And their incidence of prolactin is very low on a low-fat diet. The moment you go on the American diet, the prolactin levels raise to very high levels, much like a breastfeeding woman, but they're chronically high, and it stimulates estrogen dominance and prolactin problems, and you develop breast cancer. What if we could alter the course of that disease 20 years ahead of time? What if we could then, forgive me, but I'm showing you the example of a woman who's had low estrogen levels all her life, barely developed breast tissue, nursed five children. This woman had estrogen dominance. Every month of her period, she'd have very painful, hurting breasts. This woman had normal breast tissue. By the way, she's vegetarian, follows a low-fat diet, fruits, vegetables, rice, potatoes, exercises, and maintains a positive attitude. Totally healthy breast tissue. And by the way, it helped me to increase my testosterone. Look at that picture, excuse me. 
I'm sorry, okay, I'm out there, right? Dim, methane is equal to two pounds of raw cruciferous vegetables. So we created a product that concentrates and removes the toxic estrogens. When you have a profile like this in a woman, especially with abdominal obesity, they have estrogen dominance. Clear it out. Most women, if you do a 24-hour urine, they'll have more of the bad estrogen and not enough of the good. You look at this man. What does he have? Estrogen dominance. He drinks beer, eats a lot of fat. This man eats a healthy diet. He exercises, he takes natural hormones, pumpkin seed, and other things like EstroBlock, as I reported in the Anti-Aging Medical News in 2003. So EstroBlock, cruciferous vegetables, but it's raw cruciferous vegetables. If you cook them, they lose all the phytonutrients. So how it works is, you take in enough methane, somewhere between 300 and 600 milligrams a day, it detoxifies the harmful estrogens, and you reduce the incidence of diseases associated with estrogen dominance. My grandfather at my age had lost all his hair. I'm not a hairy guy, but I still have my hair. My grandfather died of prostate cancer. I have a healthy prostate. He ate a high fat diet. He was a mechanic. And the doctor told him like plumbing, we can just remove the prostate, everything will be fine. Shortly after the infection killed him and he died at age 78 or so. Is it genetic? Am I predetermined to have prostate cancer? If I went to the same refrigerator and ate the same way my grandfather did, but I pee out more bad estrogen because I eat so much cruciferous vegetables every day that it detoxifies. So when my estrogen levels were first measured, I had a one-to-one -one ratio, meaning one part 2-hydroxyesterone to one part bad 16-alpha-hydroxyesterone, commonly measured by a simple test sent to Ryan or to uh, uh, Genova that can do a blood test. And then by December of 05, I had two times good to one. By November of 06, I had 13 times good estrogen to one bad. By age 51, I had a 37 to one. Men like big numbers. That's a good thing. My average client that I train can move their dangerous profile from a one to one or one to two to a profile where men need estrogen too. We need enough estrogen in our brain to think clearly and to, to have libido or enjoy sex. If you take certain drugs like Arumidex, it suppresses all the natural estrogen so low that some men have trouble maintaining erectile function. So we use certain herbs and products that release testosterone, that clear the bad estrogens. And we know from cancer uh, research that low oxygen levels in a test tube become cancerous and develop breast cancer. We know that they so show up in the target organs and you die from brain cancer. We know that isolating young white blood cells, according to Zheng Chu of Wake Forest University, he's discovered that by isolating granulocytes, the white blood cells, from a healthy young individual and infusing them to an individual who has cancer, that those white blood cells actually target the cancer, they target the cancer, and they eat away at it till it disappears. This may be the biggest breakthrough since we may not have to use chemotherapy and radiation. And even though when the radiologists and oncologists were polled, and they were asked, if you had a patient with cancer, would you undergo radiation and chemotherapy? 100% of the, the doctors said yes. And then they asked, if you or your wife had breast cancer or prostate cancer, would you undergo the oncology traditional procedures of radiation chemotherapy? 100% said no. So, this is in the medical literature, in their journals. So the beta-glucans, I believe, from medicinal mushrooms, seaweed, and activated barley, target the immune system to look for and create what's called apoptosis. You know what apoptosis is, sir, don't you know? No? Anyone know what apoptosis is? Yes, what is it? Natural cell death targeting the ability of cells to look for malignant cells and kill them. Yes? So cytokines, interleukins, TNF, is the number one cause of inflammation, but too low can have a depressed immune system. We know that colony stimulating growth factor releases stem cells into the body, but it may be too potent as a therapy. 
one of our esteemed doctors here pointed out his research, which will come out in his next published book about cytokines and issues that may be related to CSF and the release of stem cells. So we're looking at this and looking at how can we use safe natural foods to release stem cells and not have the side effects. The microscope is a high complexity test. So you can't just run out and go do testing unless you do a CLIA waved LDX lipid panel and it shows you the digital readings, then you tell them on the screen what you're seeing. So we found the loophole. You can actually motivate patients better because they don't know a thing when they see a digital printout of a cholesterol of 250 and a triglyceride of 400, do they? They have to depend on your information versus seeing it under a microscope, seeing the conditions. Now we used to think uh, crystals were common and yet we now know that they're just glass crystals on the cell fragment. So we have to tease out how to read this accurately, but this is a massive parasite in the blood. Those um, black lines or spicules uh, denoted from uh, liver uh, dysfunction from drugs or implications. These are normal healthy red blood cells, beautiful. Nine microns in diameter. Separated and clean and the way blood should look all the time. Here we see an elliptical cell I'm short, an oval cell, and that is a sign that the cell wall did not get enough B12 or folic acid and the cell did not form perfectly round and you have the preliminary case of anemia. If the cell is too small, you have microcytic anemia or you have sickle cell anemia. I could use the pointer. We look at hypersegmentation. A normal neutrophil should have two lobes. That one has three. It's another sign of B12 deficiency reported in the medical literature. We use a sublingual B12 folic acid and iron to restore the blood cell quality and shape. Lymphocytes, very important. There should be at least one or two per screen and a healthy immune system. Basophils make up 1%. If we see too many of them, there's an allergic and inflammatory infectious condition. Uh, the monocytes are very important. They make up 5 to 8%. If we see above that, there could be something fungal or infection. Eosinophils are classic classically present in elevated levels in people who have allergies, especially incompatibility. And in autism, how many here treat autism or cerebral palsy? You can see under a microscope a child who's challenged because of leaky gut. Things are flowing into their blood. They're not able to digest it. And the eosinophils increase as an allergic response of delayed basis. But if you do the old skin patch test, you'll never pick it up. That's an IgE. You need to look at an IgG test and find out what's going on. And the greatest discovery in Nobel Prize Chemistry 2008 was that jellyfish had a green fluorescence and they could tag stem cells. And when they then tagged them, they found out that stem cells, in the case of brain damage after a stroke or in the case of a, an auto accident, that the stem cells could actually gravitate, become liver, pancreatic, and here's the key, they could become brain cells and neurological cells. So I looked at that literature and I thought, maybe there's a cure for autism. Maybe there's something we can do with stem cells. I've had 10 treatments myself. Fat derived, umbilical derived, my own bone marrow derived. But I'm gonna tell you here now, do not do fat derived. The system and the ability to separate with collagenase is not perfected. I had one bad situation with that. In my conversation, is it pronounced Jan, JK Jan? In his next edition, he pointed out that Neupogen is an amazing drug, but it has side effects. And it could be, we're not sure, whether it was chemotherapy in association with, because of Neupogen, it could increase the white cell counts so the doctors didn't have to reduce the um, uh, chemotherapy drugs. So we don't know if it was the higher dose of the chemotherapy drugs or the Neupogen that caused the side effects. He has a strong feeling it's probably the Neupogen. So I'm looking at what can we do to increase stem cells? What can we do? We can use medicinal mushrooms. We can use blue-green algae. We can use things that increase stem cell production by as much as 140%. These natural products work and they increase natural stem cells and they help to modify cytokines and the inflammatory process. Mesenchymal stem cells. The literature is rich with identifying a solution to cartilage that's been broken down. The missing cartilage, the missing link to an alternative to hip, knee, and ankle and shoulder replacements. How many here treat people with, with hyperbaric who have been post-surgery from a hip surgery or some related um, orthopedic surgery? Let me see a show of hands. 
That's right, you do. But what if you could use stem cells to help to repair the damaged tissue? Dr. Shaw in Malaysia did before after MRIs and he perfected a procedure with a, a treatment of stem cells every week along with uh, irritating the area to, re, to uh, release the bone marrow to reach the cartilage which has a very poor circulation. You can see the before after pictures completely regenerating the cartilage. In fact, the aches in the joints and the, uh, the pain in the joints may relate to white blood cells and the self-destruction of eosinophil granulocytes that eat your joints away on a daily basis. How many here, be honest, have joint pain or some kind of uh, hip or shoulder or ankle issues or finger issues? Let me see a show of hands. And no one's probably ever told you that a delayed food allergy test or even under a microscope, I can show you your white blood cells breaking apart and the lysosomes floating around and eating away at your joints. I used to have a bad shoulder. It was really injured badly, and I thought it was an old injury that would never get better. Now my right shoulder is as strong as my left. After 10 stem cell treatments, after following a diet that's low in inflammatory processes, and my circulation's improved, and I can now lift as much weight with my right as my left. 1,974 lifts in one hour, continuous. In London, I represented our country, and we won Team USA lifting 45-pound dumbbells in a hammer curl press overhead. So is anyone here really strong? Let me see someone really strong. Raise your hand. Really strong. You, you really think of yourself as a very strong endurance strength athlete. No problem. I have my weights in the trunk of the car, and I challenge athletes all the time, and let's see if you can outlift me. I'm 55. I'm an old guy. Arthritis, the origin, the protocol. I'll give you the protocol. The protocols described quite clearly in my book and tapes. There's products, I give you some literature handout that may assist in stem cell release and complete rejuvenation. I've looked at stem cells from placenta, from, uh, from umbilical and bone marrow derived, but we can increase the release of stem cells as we see under a microscope, which are the main healing agent of the body. We even use a cream that helps to increase. And this is little Roman, my one and a half year old at birth removing his umbilical cord and collecting his stem cells for his future need or use should he ever need them. How many of you have ever collected stem cells from your baby or for yourself or any family member? Wonderful. You keep them stored and retain them because that's my little Roman and he's so precious. If anything ever happens, he gets in an accident, he's got his stem cells ready to go. And here's the stem cells in the actual bag. And the treatable conditions go all the way from spinal disc to acute chronic GI to diabetic conditions to probably neurological problems, and for sure it helps arthritis. And what we know from medical journal circulation, injected stem cells within four days, they gravitate to the heart, the spleen, the liver, and lungs. Remember, the Nobel Prize 2008 was awarded because they could isolate with the fluorescence and see where these stem cells go and how they act and how they restore tissues. Here's me competing in the World Championships at the Arnold Classic against the world's strongest men of all time. I found out I had to increase my core body strength with water training. And remember that orca whales, like the blue whale, they have their dorsal fin upright. But if they can't dive and jump, their dorsal fin lays over. And so all mammals have a need to change altitude. It's very important to keep us out of hydra uh, hibernation. Do you, do you, know when you're, you know when you're in hibernation? Not like a bear, you don't just fall asleep for the summer, or the winter that is. You drink coffee. You drink coffee to cut through the hibernation cycle. But what if you learned about altitude conditioning, cycled it through and learned about core body training. There's a hyperbaric facility, there's an altitude conditioner. The orca whale in captivity that cannot dive down and come up has a dorsal field that's, uh, uh, fin that's flaccid. A very clear sign of lack of vitality, lack of intimate ability. Do you know that blue whales weigh 400,000 pounds? They can swim nonstop for 200 miles. They consume 1.5 million calories. And you know what they eat? Not meat. Phytoplankton, krill. They, they enjoy these, these little microorganisms. And they have the most developed brain, the largest brain of any mammal, the most developed neurological system, all on nutrient-rich RNA, DNA, nucleotides. I use them myself. But I encourage you to learn more about altitude conditioning. It increases mitochondria. A Stanford study showed it in dramatic improvement. Uh, we see just like EPO, but I also use whole body vibration. We stand on a little vibration plate. It stimulates the lymphatics. Do you realize that lymphatics make up 36% of the fluid volume and the bloodstream only makes up 12%? How does the lymphatic 
fluids circulate through the body? Anyone, can anyone answer me that? How does the lymphatic circulation move? Muscle contraction. Will you listen to it? In fact, activating millions of one-way valves causes a vacuum of toxins, dead cells, excess proteins. When you run, sprint, get on a vibrator, vibrator plate, or a trampoline from zero to two Gs of force, Newton's law predicted by distance times, number of reps by amount lifted, you will be energized and you will cause contractions that move the lymphatics and keep you young. You know the experiments where they took petri dishes of cells and they did not clean the petri dish and the cells died rather soon. Have you all heard of the experiment where they took the petri dish of cells and they kept it cleansed of oxygen and nutrients and it lived forever. They had to stop the experiment because the researchers were like, these cells aren't going to die. You're killing your cells every day that you don't exercise or run. How many here exercise on a regular basis? I mean really exercise. Your white blood cells are stimulated from exercise. Free radical damage, inflammatory response, neutrophil viability, it's all in the medical literature, but look at this, candida, fungus in the blood. These white cells have to clear all that, and there are simple ways to clear that candida. The body has toxins in it. Look at that. Anyone know what that is? That's a bacterial form. It's a toxic rod. Blood is not sterile. At the end stage of life, you develop a lot of bacteria and fungus, but you don't want that circulating around and compromising the immune system when your immune system should be fighting cancer or dealing with common diseases. That's a parasite, staph. Look at the size of that worm. This is spicules. You know, a person drinks coffee every day and dra uses drugs of various types. Adrenal DMG, dimethylglycine. Dimethylglycine, how many of you have heard of the treatment for autism with dimethylglycine? Downstream, it helps glutathione. You've heard of glutathione. It supports 37 different chemical reactions of the liver. You really need to look into adrenal function for autistic kids. Aging sucks. This is what it looks like. It looks real bad. And the cells start dying when you do not supply the oxygen, the nutrients, and the energy, and everything that it needs.